Hello, everybody, and welcome to the now fourth attempt at this session of The Pitching Hour. My name is Ryan Craig, and my co-host here today is Kurt Kuhn. Hello, hello. I am uh, slightly tired. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, blame the pandemic. Um, uh, so today we have a couple of soft pitches uh, Kurt, I believe yours is Star Wars centric and mine is Spider Man centric. We wanted to diversify this. Yeah, and uh, uh, the... very, very, uh, very topical. <laughs> yes, I should also mention, and we can edit this while, like, for part of the beginning. Yeah. Uh, this is a podcast about uh, basically us pitching things, whether it be movies, uh, video games, comic books, TV shows, you name it, we can pitch it. But only us. But only us. Only us. Unless we bring someone in. And then and only then will we allow somebody else to pitch. Yep. So, Kurt, uh, you, you have a Star Wars, uh, I believe a Star Wars video game you wanted to pitch? Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, EA very recently announced, or actually it wasn't even EA, DICE basically said, you yeah, know, we're not making Battlefront 3. And then it came out, the reason why is... It would have to make more sales because it's a licensed game. Mm. In spite gotcha. of the fact that EA had uh, exclusive licensing for 10 years. They had a 10-year contract, which uh, they got rid of. My, my, oh my. Okay. Yep. Now, I, I will uh, come out on the forefront and say that I'm really not much of a video game aficionado. The last game that I did play was Halo 5, and that made me, I'm not kidding, quit playing video games. <laughs> uh, it, it was more so I just kind of like fell out of it, but Halo 5 was is basically my, my de facto uh, blame. Yeah, Halo um, Crash. Yeah, I hear Halo, Halo Infinite is great, but uh, I'm I. Its story is great. I, its gameplay is good. Um, its multiplayer progression is fucking atrocious. I I've heard that there's been problems with it, and Halo is one of those games where I'm a, I'm only in it for the story, man. So, you know, I'll get to it eventually when it goes on sale or something, because I'm balling on a budget. Yeah, so uh, wait, like. At least nine months. Wait till the game's been out for a year. By then, hopefully, uh, co-op campaign and loading missions up will actually be in the game. Sounds good to me. Um, Basic functions. Fair, fair enough. Yep. So you you were you were saying about uh about yes, Star yes. Wars Battlefront three? So yes, uh, this is my uh, Star Wars Battlefront three pitch. Um. I wanna, wanna start somewhere here. Uh, we got four game modes: campaign, which would be uh, three stories set in diff the three eras. Uh, I'll expand more on what those are uh, later. Uh, the online multiplayer, which, as it sounds, it would just be regular matchmaking, um, as is currently in Battlefront Two. Uh, custom games, which they don't have at the moment. Uh, this would basically be the uh, split screen stuff from Classic Battlefront 2. Um, and you can also play them online privately with friends. Uh, basic, basically just private matches. Um, and then lastly is uh, Galactic Conquest, which is the one that I can actually talk the most about right now. So uh, you're basically given a star chart system, and this is a game mode actually from the original Battlefront 2. Uh, we, uh, basically you get a star chart of various planets in the galaxy, and, uh, you have to go, uh, either enslave the planets or free them from, uh, free them from tyranny. That's, uh, that's actually how I wrote this down. Uh, yeah. And then, uh... Let's get into some of the uh, multiplayer game types. So we got yes, please uh, do. we got supremacy, which is currently in Battlefront Two, um, the new one. Yes, uh, assume everything is from the new Battlefront games, and if it's uh, from the originals, I'll say, and if it's an original, I'll say. But uh, most of them are 
uh, just returning shit. Um, mm-hmm. So we got Supremacy, which is uh, the big multiplayer mode. It's uh, 20 versus 20 with, addish- with uh, 12 additional troops on each side. You capture command posts, and then you board a capital ship to destroy it. If the capital ship attackers win, the game ends. If the attackers on the ship lose, the battle goes back to the ground, and the fight starts over again. Uh, I think there is a time limit, but I don't actually remember. Yeah. Um... And then we got... Uh... If I'm if I'm certain, but Ryan and I have pitched these to each other before, literally two days ago. But we've refined them, and we're re-recording because I fucked up on audio on my end. <laughs> yes, this is this is true. Um, yeah. So uh, co-op, which is eight players, it was previously four. Uh, mm-hmm. eight players fight against an enemy AI team to capture or defend uh, command posts from enemy capture. Um, it's kind of in like a weird checkpoint system. So you got like, uh, you start off with two. Once those two have been fully captured, uh, you move on to the next set. And uh, it works like that on, I believe, four rounds. But I could be wrong on that. Um and then uh, next mode would be uh, Heroes versus Villains, which sounds obvious. Uh, only real difference between how it is currently in the game, it would be uh, 6 versus 6 instead of 4v4. I'll get into the Heroes and Villains a bit later. Uh, Hunt. This is returning from Classic Battlefront 2. This is uh, 8 versus 8 with the lesser units on certain planets. So Ewoks on Endor, the Tusken Raiders, and the Jawas on Tatooine. And the Wampas on Hoth. Uh, Blast, which is uh, 8v8 Team Deathmatch. I'm probably going to edit an audio clip in there because I got a funny bit for that. There you go. Uh, (laughs) Strike, which is uh, 8v8 fights for objectives in either attack or defend positions. Galactic Assault, which is 20 versus 20 in various objectives to defend or attack positions until a timer runs out or the attackers win. Uh, Starfighter Assault, which what it sounds like, it's uh, you fight starfighters, or you fight in starfighters. Um, you destroy command ships, and that's about it. Uh, extraction moving enemy cargo through various checkpoints uh, while the other team tries to stop you. Uh, Returning from Classic Battlefront 2, Capital Assault. Uh, Players get in starfighters and either board enemy ships or attempt to destroy them from the outside. Uh, And lastly, or no, not even lastly, I still got got two more. Uh, Heroic Capital Assault, which is just uh, capital assault with heroes and villains and also the use of uh, heroic ships like the Millennium Falcon or Darth Vader's TIE Fighter um, and lastly is survival this is a horde mode uh, you choose from a selection of ba- or of uh, Order 66 esque scenarios um, or like uh, Vader Down Dead Men from the uh, Marvel Comics Uh, Vader Down storyline where uh, Rebels have where You got this. You got this. Uh, I'm trying to like rush through it but I don't because like It's okay. Take take your time. Do what you need to do. But like we've also added some new stuff in there so you know. Um, Hey, let, let me put it this way. Mine, uh, mine is it's going to be a little more long-winded. So take as much time as you need to to explain everything. You know, just to yeah, yeah. You do what you need to do, basically. Uh, survival, which is basically a horde mode. Um, you fight through Order sixty six as scenarios, or uh, I've added, I've actually added a bit here. I've added two bits actually. Um. Either Order 66 scenarios or a Vader Down Dead Men, 
where uh, in the Star Wars story, Darth Vader, Star Wars Vader down, uh, Luke Skywalker crashes his X-Wing into Vader's TIE fighter, and they both crash land on a planet, uh, kind of far from each other. The rebels uh, surround Vader, and they tell him that, and he says, all I am surrounded by is fear and dead men, as he brings his lightsaber above and ignites it. Uh, the mm. other one is a new droid general. This is this is kind of a deep cut. The 2003 Clone Wars, Chapter 20. This is the General Grievous introduction. Mm. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's um, General Kenobi. No, 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 no. This is that. Uh, this is the one where. Uh, Grievous kills Shaggy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's actually that guy's name. It's Shaggy. I love that so much. Um, and then uh, there would be boss battles at the end of each round. And uh, for Org 66 stuff, uh, each boss kind of escalates. So, like, we start off with... Bounty Hunters, and then, um, we get, uh, the Grand Inquisitor, then Vader, and then Papa Palpatine. Uh. <clears throat> I love that we're still, even in this, this fourth recording, we're still calling him Papa Palpatine. He will only be, ever be Papa Palpatine. Grand Lord, Emperor, Papa Palpatine. Yep. Uh, let's go on to those, uh, that story stuff I mentioned. Um, so, I've split these up into the three ages. The Age of Republic, which is the Clone Wars. The Age of Rebellion, which is the original trilogy stuff. And the Age of Resistance, which is the, uh, sequel trilogy. Um. Mm-hmm. So we start Age of Republic by doing the Battle of Geonosis from Episode 2. There would be a section where I play uh, on the front lines as regular troopers and, you know, maybe even use uh, some of the Jedi in there. Uh, we also do a bit based on um, a mission from the game Star Wars Republic Commando, wherein we go inside one of the core ships, which is like those uh, Death Star looking things, and we uh, destroy it from the inside. Uh, then we'd go into, like, various battles from throughout, uh, the Clone Wars show and, like, the novels and the comics and, uh, recanonize a couple things. Uh, things like we, uh, do battles like, uh, Battle of Christophsis from, uh, the opening of the Clone Wars movie or the Battle of Munalis from the 2003 Clone Wars show. The better show, by the way. Fight me. Wait, sorry, say that again? I said the uh, 2003 show is better. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have to agree with you only on the fact that I have never watched the, the Cartoon Network one. So Here's, here's the thing about that uh, the Cartoon Network Dave Filoni one. People really like to say it gets better as it goes on. I disagree mainly because I kind of like the one-off stuff more. Right. And also because as they went on... Uh, they really just started making it like four episode multi parters. I think there was there was plans for one of the multi parters to be like eight episodes. Oh my god! Yeah, they uh when the when the show got canceled in uh, two thousand thirteen, they turned that into mm -hmm. uh, one of the novels. Oh uh, okay. Yeah. Um, there you go. And I, I have not I'll, read I'll be on. I've not read I'll it, be really just because I don't care. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's fair. I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, who who's the 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 Clone Wars yeah. from two thousand three? Gandy Tarasovsky was the guy behind that one. Tarasovsky. Gandy Tarasovsky. Um. Aratovsky. You might know him um, as the creator of Dexter's Laboratory and Samurai Jack. Yes, I, re I remember Samurai Jack, but I had no idea he was the creator of Dexter's Laboratory. Yeah. Um, I, I would say Tarakovsky's Clone Wars is um, that Alexandre 
Tarkovsky's uh, Star Wars Clone Wars. Andy Tartoski. The Don Donnie Kornioski. Um that he <laughs> that his Clone Wars is more memorable to me because there are there are pictures that exist somewhere of me with me shirtless with the Anakin body paint design from that on half my body. Nice. Or all of my body. I can't remember. So yeah, that that to me that is the Clone Wars. But as it should be. As it should be. And it and Anakin is as emotionally uh dense as he is uh in Hayden Christensen Hayden Christensen's tenure. So it all fits. Mm-hmm. But sorry, continue. Continue. Um Yeah, so like we would do uh Battle Munalist, there would be a couple things on the ground. Uh we would basically do that entire Arc Troopers episode where like they just fucking go through the city, they destroy the fucking tower gun and just, like, hang out and chill. Uh, we'd also do, like, the big space battle, just because I think that's fucking rad. Um, and then, like, we'd kind of continue going on with that. Um, I'm literally just, like, looking at some of the other ones because they don't actually have a bunch of them uh, listed down uh, in my fight stuff. Um... Obviously, we'd probably do, like, the Kamino fight from the uh, 2008 show when, uh, from the third season. Fight on Kashyyyk, because, of course, um, we'd play through the Battle of Coruscant on both sides. So we would play as uh, Grievous trying to get uh, Pop Palpatine, and we'd play as uh, Windu and Yoda pushing back droids before we do the space battle. Space battle ending with um, us playing through the beginning of episode 3, basically. And then we'd go into the Utapal. And the Utapal mission would be the final mission of uh, the Clone Wars Age Republic era. Because that's kind of where it really does end. Um, okay. Then we go into the uh, Age of Rebellion. We start off with uh, Battle of Lothal from the end of Star Wars Rebels. Uh, the uh, Battle of Scarif from uh, Rogue One. Destruction of uh, the first Death Star. We would even do the trench run um, because that's fucking rad. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. We'd fight on Yavin 4 as the Rebels attempt to escape from the planet. We do uh, the Battle of Makato, Makate, Makato Ta. I don't fucking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, from the mm-hmm. Star Wars 2015 mm-hmm. comics uh, mm-hmm. in the arc titled uh, Hope Dies. Uh, and like we would just keep playing through a bunch of them. Uh, Hoth from Episode 5, Endor from 6, Battle of Death Star 2. And, obviously, we would probably end this with the Battle of Jakku from uh, current Battlefront 2, and, like, a few other things. Um, Age of Resistance, this is the one that I actually got the least for. Uh, mainly, mainly just because I don't... Okay, the sequel era kind of has this weird thing where... I like ideas from it, but I don't care for it as a whole because they butchered the handling of it so much. Right. Which I think we can kind of all agree on. Well, I, uh, I most of I agree with you. As a whole, I... it was butchered because they didn't really plan it out individually. Yes. There's stuff I like from it. I agree. I agree with that completely. I, there, there, are, there are definitely things from each of them that I take away. I'm like, I like this. But yeah, as a whole, it just feels kind of, it, it doesn't flow. Well, first two for me. There's, honestly, there's nothing re- redeemable about Rest Skywalker. I, I mean, that, that, there, that, there were things I did like about that movie, but overall, that was the, that was a, a big letdown for me. I remember going to see that movie in IMAX and walking out being like, damn, I don't know why I watched that in IMAX. Yep. But yeah. Anywho. 
uh, Age of Resistance stories. Um, we'd start off with uh, Takadana from Force Awakens. Then we do a uh, Starkiller base fight. Um, the beginning of uh, Last Jedi, where we uh, destroy the big laser cannon on the Star Destroyer. And then we'd uh, go to the Battle of Crate from the end of Last Jedi. And finally, we get to end the entire thing on uh, Battle of Exegol because nobody's going to want to touch touch anything after that. And then... Uh, right. Uh, let's talk about like uh, some map locations from... Please do. Oh, yeah. Please do. I'm interested. So, uh, Age of Republic, returning ones. Naboo, Kamino, Kashyyyk, uh, Geonosis, and Felucia... New ones, at least for the EA games, uh, Coruscant, which we would have three maps, the Senate Building, the Jedi Temple, and uh, City Streets. Um, by the way, I say a lot of City Streets in this. I don't know what to call them. I don't care what to call them. I just call them City Streets. <laughs> um, we'd have like the big city sinkhole fight or uh, location from uh, Utapau, uh, the mining facility on Mustafar. We'd have two locations from Mandalore, uh, the palace area and the landing platform. Um, we would do. Uh, we would also have Dathomir, uh, and go to the Knight Brother Village and the Knight Sister Village, uh, Mun uh, Munilis, which would have three locations: the city streets, the Separatist Tower, and the Separatist Control Room. Uh, Christosis, which would have City Streets and Separatist Staging Ground. Umbara, which would be, uh, it's from the 2008 show. Um, the Republic Outpost, the Jungle Forest, and the Separatist Control Ship. And, uh, Hypori, which is from that, uh, Chapter 20 of the 2003 Clone Wars show. Which would be the, uh, Crash Republic ship. Moving on, we got the, uh, Age of Rebellion. Which would be uh, returning maps Yavin 4, Hoth, uh, Endor, Death Star uh, 1, which would have a hangar and the trench. Death Star 2 would be returning with its hangar, and a new trench slash core would be there, um, as is was from uh, Return of the Jedi. Uh, we do Bespin, Kessel from Solo. Tatooine, Scare from uh, Rogue One, and uh, Solace, which is already in the game. I legitimately don't remember the map. <laughs> I just found that out that it was in there like yesterday when I was adding more shit to this. Uh, and then new locations would be uh, Makoto, the uh, Imperial Fleet versus the Rebel Fleet, Sunspot Prison from the Clone War or from the Star Wars comic arc of the same name. Which has uh, a hangar and a uh, holding area. Uh, Lethal from Rebels, which would have city streets and like a farmland area. And uh, Moncala, which is uh, Akbar's home planet. And uh, that would just sort of have whatever is in there. Um, and then Age of Resistance uh, locations. We'd have Takadana and Maz's castle. Or Re er, returning stuff would be uh, Takadana and Maz's castle, Star Killer base, um, with a new big air space uh, airspace area, uh, crate Jakku, uh, Agent Kloss, which was the uh, resistance base in uh, Force Awakens, uh, Dakar, which would have a new big space area, and all or. Er, which was um, Dakar, which is the uh, rebel base from uh, Rise of Skywalker, and that would have a new big space area as well as uh, the Resistance base. And uh, new locations would be uh, Kajimi from uh, Rise of Skywalker, which would have a city streets, Exegol, which would be like uh, the ground area, and we would probably also have a map where we fight on the top of star destroyers because that was actually kind of cool and uh the jedi temple ruins on acto uh 
Okay. Okay. Yep. And the last thing to get into, the heroes and villains. Um, yes. Returning heroes for the Republic, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Yoda. New heroes, Ahsoka Tano, Padme Amidala, Mace Windu, Captain Rex, Commander Cody, and a spot that I have as Choose Your Jedi. Um, the idea behind this is that Jedi characters would actually be fairly limited in the Republic area, so that way everything's kind of even. Um, so if everyone has the Choose Your Jedi option selected with, because uh, there would be various Jedi in this, um, then uh, whoever wanted to use, say, Anakin, if all the Choose Your Jedi are out, Oh, well, Anakin will just have to wait till one of the Choose Your Jedi guys is dead. <laughs> uh, hmm. And who are these Jedi? You got Kiari Mundi, Aayla Sakura, Shock T, Saucy Tin. He was uh, that guy. He was one of those. He was one of the four guys who goes with uh, Mason Kit Fisto to uh, kill Papa Palp in Episode Three. He's the uh, dude with the two horns. Um, Plo Koon. Luminara Unduli and Kit Fisto. Uh, for villains, we got the returning ones of Count Dooku, Darth Maul, and General Grievous. And uh, new villains Asajj Ventress, Pre Vizsla, Savage Oppress, Cad Bane, Aura Singh, Berezafi, because they made her a villain in uh, the final arc of the 2008 Clone Wars show. And uh, Pon Krell, who is a character from that show. Okay. Uh, we got uh, Rebellion Heroes. Returning ones are the obviouses of uh, Luke Skywalker, Leia, Leia Organa, Han Solo, Chewbacca, Lando Calrissian, and Jin Erso from uh, EA Battlefront 2015. New heroes are Kanan Jarrus, Sabine Wren, Harrison Dula, and uh, Baylor Valance. From uh, the Star Wars Bounty Hunter comic series. I should also know. I actually have no idea if he's a good guy or bad guy. I'm just throwing him in there. Because I needed an X one Because I, uh, I added one more character to uh, the villains. Speaking of which. Villains. Returning ones. Darth Vader. Boba Fett. Emperor Palpatine. Uh, Bosk. Director Krennic from uh, the EA 2015. New ones are... Dengar, Tobias Bucket, or Tobias Beckett from uh, Solo, Moff Gideon from uh, Mandalorian, Grand Inquisitor, Doctor Afra, and Dirge. Um, Dirge was uh, he was a bounty hunter in that uh, 2003 Clone Wars show. He's the guy that fights Obi Wan. That's like the weird tentacle monster guy. I'm saying this for you, Ryan. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Say that again. I zoned out. <laughs> you know that, uh, you know that tentacle monster guy from uh, the 2003 show, right? Was it uh, Kit Fisto? No, 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 no. Um, he's the guy who fights Obi Wan. Oh my God! Yes. Yeah. So uh, they made him canon again as part of a storyline called War of the Bounty Hunters. Um. Oh, is that is that the the one going on right now? Uh, it finished up actually. Oh, okay, cool, uh, cool. And the guy's name was Dirge, and I have added him in to be uh, one of the villains for um, the uh, Empire. Very cool, very cool. And lastly, we no. got the uh, Age of Resistance. We got the uh, returning heroes of uh, Ray and Finn, and the new heroes of Poe Dameron, Rose Tenko, because I really want to piss off the Chuds. <laughs> and uh cause from uh star wars resistance i literally just went on wikipedia and looked up the name literally just went on wikipedia and looked up the names for characters um and then we got uh returning villains which would be uh kylo ren and captain phasma and mm -hmm. new heroes of or new villains of general hux uh general pride or allegiant general pride um, from Rise Skywalker, 
and uh, Commander Pyre from Resistance. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Is is that a, is that everything for your pitch, or do you have anything else to say? Or anything um, else to add? No, I think that's about it, honestly. All right. Well, I've got a. Well, Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, I have a pretty, uh, at least compared to last time, a pretty uh, lengthy notepad, but it still, I believe, is in the parameters of a soft pitch. So, bear with me. But, um, yes, so my pitch, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, or I may have mentioned at the top of the show, depending on depending on what which intro we use. <laughs> um, I my pitch is a Spider-Man centric pitch. I want to pitch you Spider-Man Four. No, not Tobey Maguire. Definitely not Andrew Garfield. But Tom Holland's Spider-Man Four. Now spoilers for No Way Home. But I'm assuming you've seen it, judging the box office numbers. But if you haven't, you should go watch it. Um, the way that film ends kind of gives a prom, almost a, not a promise, but an illusion with an A to um, more simpler, smaller scale Spider-Man stories, more classic types of stories where we focus on Peter and his character as well as the superheroics, but the, super, but the superheroics and the action are not the main focus. So... With that being said, uh, I'd like to open this movie with The Conversation. Now, for folks who don't know, uh, The Conversation was a story, I believe, occurred. Was it one or two issues during the J. Michael Straczynski run? You know what? Give me two seconds, and I will take a look at that. I remember it was a story that I believe came right before the 9-11 issue. Um, and the 9-11 issue was, of course, like a stopgap within his run. But either way, um, it was alluded to in No Way Home that they did have a kind of messy conversation, and it was also hinted at at the end of, no, at, at the end of Homecoming. But we never really got that. So I say open the movie up with that. Um... And do you have an answer, Kurt? Uh, I am still kind of looking. That's okay. You do what you need. To. Oh, are you are you are you doing? Are you flipping pages? I'm flipping pages. I literally brought both books out. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, yeah. You do what you need I, to I do. I literally put my headphones down so that way I could grab it. I got you. All right. I thought you were just gonna. Are you just going to Google it? No, that's, uh, yeah. that's an easy way out. <laughs> oh, hey, that's awesome. I love that. Um, it is a single yeah. issue. It is a single issue? Okay, all right. I thought so. I just I couldn't remember. All right, well, there you go. There you have it. Um, so, yes, where I want to basically somewhat adapt that single issue as the f beginning of the film. Let's say... When the movie starts and we're seeing the Sony logo, Columbia, Marvel, we don't get any big music. We're just hearing like ambience, apartment ambience, and like muffled um, cityscapes in the background, like uh, like like you know, driving cars, honking horns, that sort of stuff. And uh, when we actually open we just see peter and aunt may just sitting across from each other at their dining room table kitchen table and they're just silence and they're not even looking at each other they're just looking down and so one of them finally breaks the silence and they have the conversation or at least a rendition thereof and it ends with may just saying that like look I'm proud of your... I know you... That's right, Uncle Ben doesn't exist in the universe. 
No, he does. But does he? Of course he does. He has to. Oh, well, well he, he didn't in, in No Way Home. It may was his Uncle Ben, right? No, uh... Because no whenever, um... No Way Home, well, or, or, no, in, uh, in Homecoming, he mentions that, uh, his uncle died. What? Does he? He says something like, I think it's six, been six months since his uncle died. Huh. You know, Uncle Ben's death is always the catalyst... They just use May's death to say, with great power comes great responsibility, which is why I honestly think that bit is lazy. I got you. All right. Well, it well, gives it gives Marisa Tomei more more gravity to her character than she did before. Um, but I okay, I got you. I for, I forgot all of that stuff. It's been a while since I watched Homecoming. Um, but yeah, I had no idea. Okay, well, e either way, uh, May just says, like, how his uncle would be proud of him, his parents would be proud of him for being, you know, so good-hearted, but how she's still worried. And she says something like, you know, what if something bad happens? And then we smash cut to Peter standing over her grave in the present day. It's now autumn in New York, so uh, imagine, like, imagine throughout this movie, like, lots of orange filters and, you know, uh, reds, oranges, yellows, like, that sort of color palette. Um, so, like, a very, a very warm feeling is what we want to feel. So, Peter gets a ping on his uh, police scanner app. And he rushes to the scene. But we see Kingpin is trying to steal the lifeline tablet from a vault. Is somewhere in New York. It doesn't matter. Probably like a museum or whatever. So he stops him, of course. And then at the crime scene, Spidey is talking to Gene DeWolf, who is an, ad an advocate for him. Uh, not that the police hate Spider-Man, but, you know, some of the city is a little questionable about him because of J. Jonah Jameson's narrative. It is reaching to some of the masses, but saying there's a mass in New York is, you know, ridiculous because there's so many people. But anyway, so uh, he's just giving her the information she knows, and she men mentions how, like, you know, there's... First we got cat burglars, and now we got someone like the Kingpin. You know, everybody's stealing stuff around New York. And um, she and she mentions how she wishes Fisk would just stay as like a Hell's Kitchen problem, but now he's become a New York problem since he's gotten out. So we see a girl with white hair, college age, either a junior or senior, bump into Spider-Man as she's running to catch a bus. Uh, he locks eyes with her as she's apologizing, and she just smiles at him. It's like a warm smile, but with eyes that are almost seductive. Uh, DeWolf snaps him out of it, and um, you know we later cut to Peter going to the coffee shop that MJ works at, expecting to see her. But uh, another person is there. She goes. She's gone off to MIT, and from the person that's there, we get a sense that Peter's been frequenting at this shop a lot, and he's maybe ha even having a parasocial relationship with MJ. When all he is to her is just a regular with this new timeline. Um. So he leaves the shop, and we cut to him at his apartment, and he's social media stalking her and Ned. And he flashes back to the moment that he fell for MJ. Um, I don't necessarily know what that would be. Maybe it would be something to do with uh, trauma bonding, from the both of them being blipped out of existence for five whole years. But we don't really... I, I, I couldn't tell you what that scene would be. 
so then we're back uh, to where we were before he flashed back, and he he logs out. He he takes uh, MJ and Ned out of his search history as a symbolic way of him moving on, or at least trying to move on from that. And he's also at a point in his life where he doesn't know whether he wants to give up being Spider-Man or give up being Peter Parker since he's a nobody anyway. And he's, he's kind of at a crossroads mentally, and he's just taking things day by day while still not necessarily having an existential crisis, but trying to question um, himself. Peter is going to Empire State University, and this is where he meets Deborah Whitman, um, who's in his chemistry course, and they get along pretty well. Uh, in this scene, she would make mention that if he ever needs a study partner to hit her up, and that really she just knows what it's like to be alone in a strange place. And so they, they swap information like social media or phone number or whatever. Uh, Peter, as Spider-Man, ends up running into Black Cat. And she says how she saw him at the Kingpin crime scene and that she wants him to join her. Uh, what she's been doing is taking down low-level... what Or what he's been doing, rather. What he's been doing has been taking down low-level criminals, like guys that rob convenience stores to feed their families. And by going after the rich and the armed that they can stop those people from resorting to something like that. Basically just being Robin Hoods. He sees what she's saying, and she's not doing anything inherently wrong that he can see, so he's not going after her, but he's not interested in her offer. He's kind of just okay staying in his lane. She says she understands, and that... If he changes his mind, he can meet her at the Freedom Tower, because she goes there every night to get a good view. Later, we see Deb and Peter chatting in Central Park, having lattes, talking about life, and, you know, they're all cute and shit. And they get notifications on their phones. Uh, the Daily Bugle is reporting on, this, we'll say, some rich guy uh, being exposed for having a hand in some nasty business, whether it, you could make it up as you want. You could do hard PG-13 and say it's human trafficking or drugs or whatever. So his money, uh, the, the key note is that his money was drained from his account, and nobody knows where that money is gone. Now, the Bugle's source says that it was apparently thanks to the criminal known as the Black Cat, um, Deb says that while she doesn't believe in hurting other people and that she's more of a humanitarian, that she thinks that maybe someone like Black Cat is probably what New York needs. If that's what it'll take for um, corrupt people who have too much power to be taken down a peg. So with this in mind, later Spider-Man meets Black Cat at the tower, at the Freedom Tower saying he's in and she says they have to shake on it or else it's not an actual deal so they they shake on it i know that's very oddly specific but trust me this will come up later so throughout the movie we just see peter and deborah hang out as well as uh spider-man and black cat pulling off heists from nasty corporate guys like just to throw names out there like Roxxon or or Hammer Tech, as well as mobsters like, say, Tombstone or maybe Hammerhead. Um, they take their uh, they take the money that they get and give it to the poor, which this gives Peter really a chance um, to live a side of himself that he never thought he had, and really just explore that it gives him an edge um and he's at a, really at a point in his life where he feels like that might be what he needs that maybe that's what he wants right now however it does um feed into jj's narrative that you know spider-man is a menace black cat though assures him that jameson's narrative doesn't shine a spotlight on the bigger picture of what they're doing 
that the ends do justify the means. And um, he asks her, well, why are you in this anyway? You know, what, what's the point? And she says that at one point in her life, she trusted a powerful man and he took advantage of her, uh, it, it took advantage of that trust in a way she never expected him to. Um, he stole something from her that she can't ever get back. And the best thing that she can do is for revenge and for the greater good of other people is take from is take things from people like him. And she says how someone like Spider-Man, someone trying to do good, is what keeps her doing what she's doing. We have a, a few beats and then maybe some other dialogue. And then they kiss. And they kiss more. And it cuts away. You get the picture. Mm-hmm. We see later that Deborah. It's it's been a few days now. Uh, we see Deborah go up to Peter between classes, and she asks if he's okay, and and that how basically he's been a little distant lately, and he apologizes and he says he doesn't mean to, and that he's just dealing with some things. She tries to give him some positive affirmations, and he thanks her, but says he doesn't really know why she gives him any mind. Not that he doesn't. Not that he wants her to stay away, but that she's really the only person he knows on campus, and he's truly a nobody. So, you know, we, there's nothing special about him. She says, basically, like she's tells, like she's told him before that she knows what it's like to be alone, and she's learned to enjoy the simple things in life, and that he's not a nobody, that he's more special than he thinks he is. She leans into him, and then he gets a text from Black Cat. She sees it and, and steps back a bit, and and he's and he tries to assure her. He's like, it's not, it's not what you think it is. And she's like, well, okay, so what is it then? And he can't give her an answer. So she says she'll just talk to him later, and she just walks away. Doesn't really like. Ag- she's not aggressive. She's just like, all right, well. I'll let you do your thing, and I'll talk to you later. She turns around. Peter can only see the back of her head, but we, as the audience, see her like start to cry, really. Uh, we cut to Spider-Man meeting up with Black Cat and says that while he's had a lot of fun, that he feels like this should be his last ride. And that it's nothing personal. It's just, you know, he feels like he's played his part. She says she understands and that they'll end things on a high note. And so they go to an undisclosed location where they break into a vault with the lifeline tablet within it. Peter's spider sense goes off, but he's already too late. Black Cat injects him with something. And he's beginning to black out. And she lets him down easy. And she says, you know, she's sorry for making deals behind his back. And that they really just needed to take out the heavy hitters first. He begs her, like, please don't do this. And she says it's the name of the game. And that she didn't want to play with his feelings. But when the king's ransom is so high, it's so hard to say no. She kisses him goodbye. Says thank you for everything. But this is where we're done. And then everything goes to black for him. He wakes up with police surrounding him with lots of questions and Jean DeWolf um, is the one to wake him up. She says that he has a lot of explaining to do and he says that he knows he does, but he has to stop Black Hat first. And so she, so he gives her the information that he knows basically anything that she told him before he passed out. She begrudgingly trusts him and lets him do his thing, and she gives him a location that her contact in the feds thinks that the kingpin's hiding at. That it's not, you know, she's not 100% sure, but that's the only lead they have. And that basically he better not disappoint her, because she doesn't want to have to go after him. So we cut to that location, and we see Black Cat is about to give the tablet to Kingpin. But she, she's basically saying, I want my money first. 
Like I, you know, this is a deal. The deal's a deal. And as they're about to exchange, uh, Spider-Man breaks in and fights the both of them. And Peter is starting to get pretty aggressive because he he's angry. He he just had his his feelings played with, and he broke someone's heart. The only other person that he knows, like her, her heart is shattered because of his act actions because of him focusing so much on Catwoman and or not Catwoman fucking Black Cat um cut that cut that cut that cut that because of him so focusing so much on Black Cat um so he's really just demanding why why the lifeline tablet what do you need it for I'm going to take you down whatever and Kingpin admits it's because Vanessa his wife has terminal cancer and so he brings him to a room that she's staying in, and we see she's like on this bed hooked up to machines, and she's just, she's not looking good. She has this very like joyful but faint, like just painful smile, painful to look at whenever Fisk walks in, and Peter's just standing in the doorway, and he's like, God damn it. And Kingpin kind of talks about the same thing with basically trying to also say, trying to echo a version of what Black Cat was saying to him, how the ends justify the means. That, yes, I know my means of getting something like this was, um, was not ethical, but I'll do anything for my wife. And so Peter uh, tries to make a deal with them. She's like, he's like, okay, I will let, oh, I won't take this opportunity away from you to save your wife. I'll let you use the lifeline tablet, but you got to turn yourself in. And, and Kingpin's like, all right, sure. So they use the lifeline tablet. It works. She's okay. And then Kingpin gets his, you know, pretty much six his guys on Spider-Man. And Kingpin's like, well, we didn't shake on it, so it's not a real deal. Peter, of course, beats the fuck out of all of them, beats the fuck out of Kingpin in front of Vanessa, and gets Gene Wolf at the place. And he's also sure to stop Black Cat before she goes anywhere else. Um, as... Black Cat is being carted away. He, you know, the wolf lets him have the chance to talk to her first. And he's basically just asking her, was any of this real? Like, was was all our, our, our conversations, our time together, was there a part of it that meant anything to you? And she just says... I enjoyed the time we had and leaves it at that. So it could be that no, it didn't mean anything, but she likes, you know, the company or there's a part of her that it did mean something to her, but she ultimately chose the score over him. Uh, later on, we just see news reports of, you know, Kingpin going back to prison and, Alicia Hardy, the black cat, whatever. Um, Deborah does, or Peter reaches out to Deborah and says that really just he's sorry for everything, that he wasn't trying to lead her on, and he does like her, and what she said to him means a lot. And she says, well, I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate you reaching out. And I'd love to be your friend, but I don't think I'm in a place right now to be with another person romantically. And he, he takes that. He's like, that's totally understand. Thank you for being a friend. Cue Golden Girls. Rest in peace, Betty White. 
uh, the at the end we the very end we see Peter just standing uh, at the top of the Freedom Tower as the sun is rising and he goes to swing that and then we get this this bittersweet sense that even though nothing is going right for Peter at this moment that at the very least he can find this balance within himself now that he doesn't need to choose Spider-Man or Peter Parker that he realizes thanks to Deborah that he can enjoy the small things in life that Peter Parker is just as important as Spider-Man. And that's really all I got. All right. Hello? Yep. No, I'm still here. Hello? Yeah. Okay. 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 You thought I disconnected or that I had my mic muted. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's all I got, really. Um, I know for, from our, and you can cut this part out, I know from our last recording, I was alluding that, oh, maybe, maybe Felicia Hardy can also go to Empire State University and that maybe she knows Peter's identity and vice versa. And it would be a weird character. It would be a, yeah, it would be a weird character, but it would also be a, too much of a departure from Black Cat herself, because Black Cat's whole thing is that she doesn't want to know. Now I know in the Michelinie run it was a little different, but that she doesn't want to know Spider-Man's identity. That she loves Spider-Man, not Peter Parker, and so I felt like it would be weird. I, I did think about a scene where whenever, you know, before they shake on it, or maybe after, instead of them shaking on it, she's like, I need some collateral here, though. And she, you know, takes off her mask and says, I'm Felicia Hardy. I'm Walter Hardy's, you know, daughter, whatever. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I trusted you with my identity. Now I need to know that... I, I, he's, she says, I... You can trust. Basically, she's like, I want to form trust. And so Peter takes off his mask and he says, I'm Peter Parker and I'm a nobody. Because with this new timeline, nobody knows who Peter Parker is. So who gives a fuck if he does give out his identity? Nobody can really track him besides knowing that he goes to ESU. And so I thought about that. I'm like, oh, that would be a cool scene. I'm like, yeah. No. That's dumb. <laughs> so, or I, I scrap all of that, and so, you know. Yeah. No, I get it. Yep, yep. But yeah. <sighs> we are both surprisingly oh, low energy awkward. for this. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? It might work. It. It uh... might work. I think it's better, but like audio definitely going to be better on this one. Energy it's better than the last one, but hey, you know what? This is the one that's gone out. Yes, I would agree. Well, thanks everybody for watching. No, it's a little too high energy. I'm not feeling that. I'm not feeling that. How do we want to end this out, Kurt? Uh, let's do something natural. Do something natural. Bye. Bye, everyone. Alright. How's that? Yeah, that works. Okay. Uh, Alright. We'll call that the ending. <laughs>